Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, and welcome to Garner Evangelical Free Church. Welcome on a on a, a cool, breezy, hazy fall sun fall Sunday. It's wonderful to see everybody here this morning, inside, outside. Um, it's great to see people who are, are ready to um, listen to trains. <laughs> um, so I'm All righty. I don't remember that in the Bible. Um, some announcements for today. Uh, we starting with, with Sunday school. Uh, just a reminder that we have uh, started both uh, adult and um, children's Sunday school. So Jam is going at, at 845. Um, so that's exciting to see all the, all the kids back and, and worshiping um, and the, the adults. Uh, we're, we're also uh, meeting. Um, we're working our way through Acts and we'll be concluding that here pretty shortly. Um, right now, um, well, I guess we'll, we'll just talk about what, what's going to look like next week. Uh, next week, we will we'll actually be inside and uh, there will be an email that goes out um, either today or tomorrow. So kind of look forward to what that is going to look like. Um, and just be aware that uh, when, when we do send that out, that the, the next two weeks, so next Sunday and the, and the following Sunday, will be kind of treated as, um, as, as a short-term trial run of, of what a new format is going to look like. So we, we won't be out here but we will be inside and we will be trying um, trying our best at the time to, to reach um, everybody at, at their comfort level and, and personal, um, personal needs. Um, but we will, we will be uh, sending out a, an email about that very shortly. And so we'll, we'll look for, forward to, um, to doing, both doing that and to receiving feedback on uh, what works and what doesn't work and making changes to go from there. Because like I said, um, that'll be a two-week trial after that and um, hopefully can make uh, some incremental changes from there just to make sure that we don't want to leave anybody out and we want to make sure that everybody's being reached. Um, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of a kind of a tricky uh, tricky spot here. It's either in the sun or out of the wind. So it looks like Todd's going out of the wind, out of the wind. Um, for Awana, so Brooke Henders and Brooke Bonzi, or they're trying to get Awana program back up and going for the year. Uh, we still need help. We need some volunteers uh, to make that happen. And um, Awana has been an, uh, a fantastic outreach uh, opportunity for. Uh, not only the kids of our church, but we get a lot of a lot of attenders that are, are from outside of our church as well. So if that's if that's something that is on your heart to help out with, um, please reach out to Brooke Bonzi, or chances are she'll be reaching out to you. So just just cut out the middleman. Um, our church is currently responsible for the shifts at God's Pantry in October. These shifts are Mondays, 8:30 to 11 a.m. and Thursdays. 3:30 to 6 p.m. Uh, please check your calendar to uh, to plan when you can volunteer and or pray for those who commit to serving and for God to be glorified through the meeting for the meeting this need in Hancock County. COVID-19 protocols are that those in need are served by drive up. There are five adults per shift that are needed. Um, and in our announcements email that went out to the congregation, there is a link in there uh, that you can go and sign up to help out with God's Pantry. Uh, let's see, our missionaries of the month still are the Williamses and their mission in Peru. Um, they have a praise this week that uh, while the churches are still closed down, small groups within the Genesis Church are meeting and more importantly are thriving. Um, it's a wonderful praise to be able to, to be able to say that in, in this time. This morning, um, uh, Sam Faust will be giving the message again. Uh, he was here a couple weeks ago and did a fantastic job, and we um, uh, are looking forward to uh, what, what he has to, to say this week. Um, with Pastor Haddon's uh, heart condition and health, just overall health condition, he's still uh, taking some time off. So I believe Sam will be here the next three weeks. 
Uh, so th that'll be that'll be wonderful to be able to get some continuity and messages and and uh, and see what God has to say through him. Um, Uh, our fighter verse here for this morning comes from Psalm chapter 23, verses 25 and 26. It says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. Okay. Okay. I think the equipment's okay. I think I think we're okay. Let me go back to that. Thanks, John. Our fighter verse for today comes from Psalm chapter tw 73 verses 25 and 26. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much here this morning that we're able to gather. We're able to gather free of free of condemnation, free of persecution, um, that we're able to worship you freely in, the, in, your, uh, in your wonderful outdoors and your wonderful indoors, Lord, and, and at home. We thank you for the volunteers that have been able to make that happen. We thank you for this entire time that, that we've uh, been outside, that we've not lost, not lost uh, perspective of you, Lord. We thank you that you are able to work through this church, that you're able to make your word known, and that uh, the people of this church are able to hear it and be able to understand through the help of your Holy Spirit. We pray here this morning um, that the congregation members uh, are able to receive the message and to understand it and to um, just know you more. That's our desire, Lord. And during our time of worship, that that would be pleasing to your ears. We thank you for the Williamses this, this month, Lord. We thank you the, for their wonderful mission in Peru, and we, we pray that, uh, or we, we give you wonderful praise that uh, even though the churches are shut down, that these small groups are able to meet, and um, that your name is being uh, spread like wildfire down there. Uh, Lord, we, we pray again for this church. We pray for our church unity, and that... Uh, that our church would be made stronger through this entire season of COVID and through everything, um, everything else that's going on in this world, Lord. We pray that you would be the one that's made known um, and, and let the things of this earth pass away, Lord, and just let you be the only thing that remains here. We, uh, we pray for um, Pastor Haddon at this time. We pray that uh, he's able to rest again and that the... Um, that his heart rhythm issues would, would go back to normal and that you would miraculously make him better and be able to preach again, Lord. Lord, we look forward to that day. Uh, please be with, uh, with Sam here this morning as he gives the message. Uh, protect him. Uh, protect him from the evil one. And, um, and yeah, just speak through him. Um, Lord, please help us to be a light, uh, the, a light that, that can shine in our community and that you would be reflected uh, in, in all that we do. Help us to be that light in our families um, and to uh, further your gospel through, um, through telling of our children and through telling of our neighbors. We, we thank you for that gift. Lord, it's in your name we pray. Amen.
Okay, so Sam's going to give the message here this morning, um, and it sounds like we're going to be doing a, a bit of a series, so I'm excited to hear uh, some of that. Thank you, Jared. It is good to be back with you. I think trains are mentioned in the Bible. Isaiah 6. Isaiah was, it said, uh, the year King Uzziah died, he was in the temple, and the train of God's robe filled the temple. The church I served in Wisconsin, the uh, platform and there's a wall and then outside and about 20 yards behind it was train tracks which they never ran on Sunday until they started the frac sand you've heard about frac sand well the, that part of Wisconsin is where the frac sand came from so then the trains were running seven days a week 24 hours a day and uh, I knew I was on schedule church wise if I when I got up to preach usually one went by and it was right at a crossing, so <sighs> And um, I've marveled for, for years when you read in church history uh, George Whitfield, right around uh, late 1700s, right around the time that uh, the U.S. declared its independence. John Wesley, these guys preached in the open air all the time. And they didn't have one of these or these things. And I could not, I can't figure out how they did it. Unless they figured out where the wind was coming from and had the wind at their back to carry their voices. Uh, even, the, even the guys that spoke indoors in large buildings, D.L. Moody, uh, how he would do it without any amplifications beyond me. My voice wouldn't reach the first row, probably. But uh, So we're thankful that we uh, are in the time that we live. I am doing a mini-series for three, three sermons in a row. It's, uh, I call it Revival on the Eve of Destruction. And uh, the first increment is as it says here in the program, destruction destined. So as we turn our attention to God's word, let's bow once again in prayer. Father, we are truly thankful for the many, many blessings that we bask in because of your love. the sunshine and the rain that you bestow on all of us and the son of God who took our punishment on the cross and we thank you also for your word and the power that it can have in our lives if we will consult it embrace it and live by it so speak to us through your word now we pray in jesus name amen evil hung like a dark cloud over the nation no corner of it was free from this oppressive satanic grip government corruption was rampant Officials paraded their sin openly. Godly values were laughed out of the debate. Upright leaders, targets of malicious hate and violence. Parents murdered their children. Innocent blood flowed in the streets. Immorality of every ilk flourished. Prostitution, homosexuality openly practiced and viewed favorably. Religion consisted of fraud and manipulation. Leaders exploited people for their money and allowed for immoral and deviant lifestyles. Is this a description of the United States in 2020? No. 
It's Israel. In 650 BC. And yet it is a distant mirror of where we live today. The record of Israel's hideous sin against God, his righteous declaration of judgment, and then how revival broke out on the very eve of that destruction is a fascinating account. But the narrative actually begins 700 years earlier at the end of Moses' life. Israel, as you recall, was on the doorstep of the promised land. It spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness. That generation that had refused to take the land 40 years earlier had died. So Moses gives them the law for the second time. That's what the word Deuteronomy means, the second giving of the law. And he concludes with a warning, which is also a prophecy regarding the nation's future, should they forsake the Lord. So if you have your blueprints with you, take it in turn to Deuteronomy chapter 31. I call God's word a blueprint because in Jeremiah 29, 11, it says that God has plans for us. Plans for good, to give us hope, to give us a future. I want to begin here in Deuteronomy 31 at verse 14. The Lord said to Moses, Now the days of your, of your death are near. Call Joshua and present yourself at the tent of meeting where I commissioned him. So Moses and Joshua came and presented themselves at the tent of meeting. Then the Lord appeared at the tent in a cloud, pillar of cloud, and the cloud stood over the entrance of the tent. And the Lord said to Moses, You're going to rest with your fathers, and these people will soon prostitute themselves to foreign gods of the land where they are entering. They will forsake me and break the covenant I made with them. On that day, I will become angry with them and forsake them. I will hide my face from them. They will be destroyed. Many disasters and difficulties will come upon them. And on that day, they will ask, Have not these disasters come on us because God is not with us? And I will certainly hide my face on that day because of their wickedness and turning to other gods. Now write down for yourself this song and teach it to the Israelites and have them sing it so that it may be a witness for me against them. When I have brought them into the land flowing with milk and honey, the land I promised on oath to their forefathers, and when they eat their fill and thrive, and they will turn to other gods and worship them, rejecting me and breaking my covenant. And when many disasters and difficulties come on them because... They will have forgotten me. I know that they are disposed to do even before they do it. And I will bring them into the land I promised them on oath. So Moses wrote down the words of the song. He taught it to Israel that day. The road to destruction has warning signs. In fact, the road to destruction has many warning signs. Moses did die. Joshua took over. They conquered the land. There's that period of the judges, about 400 years, and then they wanted a king. So they had Saul. Saul rejected God. He raised up David and then Solomon. And at the end of Solomon's reign, there was civil dispute between the ten kingdoms or the ten uh, tribes became the northern kingdom. Judah, Benjamin became the southern kingdom. And it was a divided nation. All the kings of the north were evil. Judah had a mixture, some good, some evil, some listened to God, but both spiraled downward, as Moses had predicted. And they made three errors that serve as warnings to us as well that we want to focus on today. And that first error was infidelity. Infidelity, as we just read in Deuteronomy 31. When I say infidelity, what that word means is to break faith. The breaking of faith, in this case with God, breaking His covenant. But theirs was a subtle infidelity, not overt, not in your face. 
They kept up appearances. Even as they were worshiping other gods, they would go to the temple and go through the motions. The three-step progression of their infidelity, again, was mentioned by Moses. First of all, taking him for granted. If you're still in Deuteronomy chapter 31, turn back to chapter 6. This Bible I'm using has very, very thin paper. And so I was curious how the wind might wreak havoc on some of the papers might end up over there in the weeds. <laughs> Not careful. In chapter 6, again, this is Moses speaking to a group of listeners that most of them did not witness the crossing of the Red Sea. They weren't born yet. They were born in the desert during those 40 years. So he tells them a little bit of the recent history, but then also warns them, beginning at verse 10. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land, large, flourishing cities that you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things that you did not provide, wells that you did not dig, vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful not to forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt out of the land of slavery. They took God for granted, thinking, we're owed this. It's an entitlement thinking. God owes me this, these blessings. After all, he chose me. Pride starts to well up, but not just taking for granted. The, the next obvious step is to take credit for his deeds. Just a couple chapters over in chapter 8. Beginning at verse 10. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I'm giving you today. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build houses and settle down, when your herds and flocks grow large, your silver and gold increase, and all that you have is multiplied, then in your heart you become proud and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. He led you through that vast and dreadful desert, a thirsty and waterless land with venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of the hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the desert, something your fathers had never known, to humble you and to test you, so that in the end it might go well with you. You may say to yourself, my power, my strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. They took credit for what he had done. What more warning could God have given? This is spiritual pride, applying God's word to everyone else, thinking that we're exempt somehow from his commands. It's so easy to fall into this trap, by the way. Thinking we're so righteous and looking down on others. Israel did it as a nation. A little New Testament commentary on this in Romans 2.24. Paul, in writing to those believers, quotes from both Isaiah and Ezekiel. And he says... God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you as a nation, Israel. You've probably all seen many different depictions of Jesus. When I was a kid, an artist whose last name was Solomon uh, painted a, a picture, portrait of Jesus that many, many churches had. And there's other ones, Jesus, of course, with children. There's one called, in the 70s, it was made the laughing Jesus. So he's got a laughter face. And I've wanted to commission someone who has good uh, drawing ability 
to paint what I would say is the black eyed Jesus, Jesus with a black eye, because that's what Paul was saying. Our behavior, our demeanor can give Jesus a black eye. I cringe every time some high profile celebrity who names the name of Christ uh, falls into sin or his sin is found out. Because then we hear all these pundits say, yep, there's another Christian who is out there doing their own thing Monday through Saturday, but then on Sunday they try to look pious and holy. We can give Jesus a black eye. That third step was taking part in idols. This is repeated several times. But again, in chapter 6, he repeats it over and over again in verse 14. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the peoples around you. For the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God, and his anger will burn against you, and he will destroy you from the face of the land. Don't follow other gods. And again in chapter 8. Verse 19. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed like the nations the Lord destroyed before you. So you will be destroyed for not obeying the Lord your God. 700 years later, this is exactly what happened. Jeremiah was just beginning his ministry when Josiah became king. And he had already been warning the people of their apostasy. In Jeremiah 2.13, he says, My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, God is speaking, the spring of living water, and they have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns, that won't hold any water. Now, we don't use cisterns very much today, although there are, we have tanks here and there. But if you could choose between water from a spring and water that's been in a cistern for a while, we would all choose the water from the spring. It's obviously the fresh water. But Israel, not only was it water from a cistern, it was broken cistern. It wouldn't even hold the water. So it would seep out and be empty. And yet that's what they preferred. This is seen in empty religion, going through the motions. The trappings of religion. Some have called it head knowledge without heart reality. It's what I, as a youth pastor, would tell the teens. It's playing church games that we say and do things over here but our heart is over there such was their infidelity but the uh, a second error was injustice injustice Deuteronomy 17 is where Moses mentions this beginning at verse 14 When you've entered the land the Lord your God is giving you, and you've taken possession of it and settled in it, and you say, Let us set us over us a king like the other nations around us. Be sure to appoint over you a king that the Lord your God chooses. He must be from among your own brothers. Do not place a foreigner over you, one who is not a brother Israelite. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, do not go back the way you came. He must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. This was a warning against corrupt leadership. And Israel failed here as well. They had unqualified leaders. I mentioned how the kingdom divided into a northern and southern kingdom. 1 Kings 12 tells us that Jeroboam, who led the rebellion, realized that if we follow the law, we're going to have to go to Israel, southern kingdom, to Jerusalem six times a year for the feasts. So he set up gods in the northern kingdom. And then it says that he appointed priests 
from anyone. They didn't have to be descendants of Levi. Scripture warns about unqualified leadership. Proverbs mentions this quite a bit. In chapter 25, remove dross from silver and out comes material for the silversmith. Remove the wicked from the king's presence and his throne will be established in righteousness. When a king is rebellious, it has many rulers, but a man of understanding and knowledge maintains order. If a ruler listens to lies, his officials become wicked. Where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint, but blessed is he who keeps the law. But not only unqualified leaders, there were unscrupulous leaders. Both civil leaders and religious leaders. Ezekiel warned of this, Woe to the shepherds of Israel, in Ezekiel 34, who only take care of themselves. Should they shepherd not take care of the flock? You eat the curds, clothe yourself with the wool, and slaughter the choice animals, but you don't take care of the flock. Today we are guilty of similar corruption. Leaders parade their sin. Imagine that you have a business with just under 550 employees. That's how many there are in the U.S. House and Senate. And I did a little search. I won't take the time to do it now, but to just use a search engine and Google House of Representative uh, lawbreakers or people who are under indictment, people who are in jail. Some years ago when Rod uh, Bolojnovich was the governor of Illinois and he was indicted for corruption, he was the fourth Illinois governor to go to prison since 1960. The comedians were having a field day with it. They said in Joliet, which is one of the state pens in Illinois, they have one wing that's designated just for governors. unscrupulous leaders that are tolerated infidelity injustice but perhaps worst of all the third error was indulgence indulgence and it crept in slowly if you want to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 29 if you have I don't know if you uh Mark your Bible. Some people do extensively. Some don't much at all. Well, write this down somewhere. Deuteronomy 29, 19 to 21. Because this is at the root of so much of the problems that the churches experience. Moses wrote, When such a person hears the words of the oath... He invokes a blessing on himself and thinks, I will be safe even though I persist in going my own way. He's speaking out of both sides. I'm going to do my own thing, but God's still going to bless me. This is the, the grand delusion that Satan has convinced so many people of. You can do what you want, and yet God is going to bless you. I will be safe even though I persist in going my own way. This will bring disaster on the watered land as well as the dry. The Lord will never be willing to forgive him. His wrath and zeal will burn against that man. All the curses written in this book will fall upon him. And the Lord will blot his name out from under heaven. The Lord will single him out from all the tribes of Israel for disaster. According to the curses of the covenant written in the book of the law. Israel as a nation took this posture. We can do whatever we want. God is obligated to bless us. And so they indulged. Self-gratification, the exaltation of pleasure, hedonism, they went for it. You're probably not aware of this, and you're probably better off to not be. But this January was the 19th annual no pants subway ride in New York City started in 2001 
each January, people get on the subway without wearing any pants. The group Improv Everywhere instigated this celebration of silliness, they call it. And now dozens of cities worldwide participate. During the fifth annual event, it was halted by the police and eight people were arrested in their underwear. A month later, a judge dismissed them of all the charges because Apparently, it's not illegal just to walk around in your underwear in New York City. Some might find that somewhat humorous, but it's a sign of this indulgence that is revealed in two ways. One is immorality. For Israel, this meant embracing the lewd festival idolatry called Baal worship. Baal was what is called a fertility cult. It was basically lust, religiousized, turned lust into a religion. I won't get into the details of that. For us today, it's an entertainment addiction and also the types of entertainment that rake in the dollars. Sex, of course, has always been a cash crop. And now on networks, cable, streaming, satellite dish, you name it. It's also the largest money maker on the internet. No desire that people have should be thwarted or even delayed. But it goes well beyond that to debauchery. If you've been keeping up with some of the news, sex trafficking is back as federal agents are making raids and finding hundreds of children that are being exploited in our nation as well as around the world. New Testament writers warned of this Paul in Ephesians 4, having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. In Romans 13, he wrote, Let us not behave indecently, but decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissensions and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. He expanded upon that in Galatians 5.16. So I say, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sin nature. For Israel, the storm was brewing yet they refuse to repent. And we are walking, no, we're running down the same path. It's as if we've taken that playbook and we're following it to the letter. So it is foolish to think that we can escape the same judgment that God promised to Israel. As a nation, we were conceived in liberty, but like Israel, we've taken God for granted and finally expelled him from the public square. We're thankful that we still have the freedom to worship here, but because of this virus, depending on what state you live in, it's illegal to go to church. You can still go to Walmart, but there's states, California's been fighting over this, where they say you can't get together. George Washington warned about this in his farewell speech. The propitious smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right which heaven itself has ordained. You may have heard of Abraham Lincoln's proclamation for a national day of fasting. People quote it. And so I went searching 
And I found the entire text. And I wonder if you will patiently listen. It's kind of long. But as I read this, and you absorb what you hear, imagine, just as you're listening, imagine if a mayor, a governor, you name it, any elected official would get up and say these words today, what would happen? Just, just to think about that. Whereas the Senate of the United States, devoutly recognizing the supreme authority and just government of Almighty God in all the affairs of men and of nations, has by a resolution requested the President to designate and set apart a day of national prayer and humiliation and whereas it is the duty of nations as well as men to own their dependence upon the overruling power of God to confess their sins and transgressions in humble sorrow, yet with the assured hope that genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon, and to recognize the sublime truth announced in Holy Scriptures and proven by all history, that those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord." This isn't a preacher talking. This is the President of the United States. And insomuch as we know that by His divine law, nations like individuals are subject to punishment and chastisements with this, in this world, may we not justly fear that the awful calamity of civil war which now desolates the land may be punishment? inflicted upon us for our presumptuous sins to the needful end of our national reformation as a whole people? We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied, enriched, and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. It's exactly what Moses said in Deuteronomy. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God that made us. It behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power, to confess our national sins, and to pray for clemency and forgiveness. Now, therefore, in compliance with the request and fully concurring with the views of the Senate, I do by this proclamation designate and set apart Thursday, the 30th day of April, 1863, as a day of national humiliation, fasting, and prayer. And I do hereby request all peoples to abstain on that day from their ordinary secular pursuits to unite in their several places of public worship or respective homes in keeping the day holy to the Lord and devoted to the humble discharge of religious duties proper to that solemn occasion. All this being done in sincerity and truth, let us then rest humbly on the hope authorized by divine teaching that the united cry of a nation will be heard on high and answered with blessing, no less than the pardon of our national sins and the restoration of our now divided and suffering country to its former happy condition of unity and peace. Wow! So I wondered what actually happened on April 30th, 1863, if we were to just select a city at random or go to Washington DC where the proclamation was given and just wander around that day and see did anybody take this seriously the best we could muster most recently and I say recently it was 19 years ago after 9-11 both houses of Congress met on the Capitol steps and saying God bless America maybe you remember that I remember thinking at the time how these are the people that have kicked him out of government, out of the public eye, how hypocritical that was. What will it take for us to wake up as a nation? 
and what is our role as this tragedy plays out, and we're watching it play out before our very eyes. Jeremiah should be our example. He called the nation to turn from evil, and he was opposed, he was laughed at, and he was mistreated. May I suggest, and I'll close with four steps. First of all, don't, don't join in the evil. Rather, do what is right. That's Romans 12, 21. Don't be overcome by evil. Overcome evil with good. And then be salt and light. Don't be afraid to speak. And don't give up. Endure. Stand firm. And fourthly, trust in the Holy Spirit to lead and to guide through His Word. If we're not going to be in this book, which is our marching orders, then we're not going to know what God wants us to do. Stay tuned. Uh, next week, the next installment is Destruction Decreed, the point of no return. We'll take up then. Let's pray. Father, we recognize our national sins and our individual sins that we too have wandered from you. We take you for granted. We take credit for what you've done. And we just go through the motions of religion with no heart relationship with you. Lord, I pray if there are any here or watching that they would do a spiritual inventory and ask, do I really know Jesus? Have I repented of sin and turned to him? Have I put my faith and trust in him and his death on the cross for me? Because that's the first step for all of us. And for those of us that know you, that we would walk with you. Because each step we take is going to get harder and harder as opposition increases. We need your spirit now more than ever. Work in us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. I was trying to, to uh, as I was walking up here thinking, is it better to stand or to sit? I wonder if we stand, if some of our chairs will maybe move. But you know what? I'll just leave that up to you. As we de, um, gather together right now to worship God in song. Our call to worship is Psalm 73, 26. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. One version, instead of saying my flesh and my heart may fail, says my health and my spirit may fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. When we say that God is our, our portion, we are saying that he is our all sufficient one. The source of all we could ever need, whatever our circumstance. We have the grace of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives to strengthen us. We have this promise both today and in eternity. Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So as we sing this morning, as we proclaim God is my portion, we are affirming that God is the source of all that is good. He is the portion of our life now and in the life to come. Other things in our lives may fail, but can we sing with confidence this morning, God is the strength of my heart. He is my portion forever. So again, if you want to stay seated, that is okay. If you want to stand, well, let's honor our God in song this morning. As we sing, Your Love Defends Me. If you have a bulletin, the lyrics are there. Over here at this table, there are a few more. You can use your phones as well. You are my joy, you are my song. You are my joy, you are my song, you are the well, the one I'm drawing from, you are my refuge, my whole life long, where else would I go, surely my God is the strength of my soul. Your love defends me, and when I feel like I'm all alone, your love defends me. 
Gracious Heavenly Father, we do rejoice in that you have already overcame the grave and that nothing is impossible for you. So we just want to honor you this morning, Lord, and to praise you. Um, may you love what you hear and you see from your people today. We pray this in your name. Amen. Today's benediction is from Hebrews 13, verses 20 and 21. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with every good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. And to that, all God's people said, Amen. Amen.